Okay, uh, we should start. So the the next lecture is uh, by Milen. He will explain us what is not new in modular Java. Enjoy. Hey, hey, hello, and welcome, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. So, um, yeah, come in. <laughs> uh, for those of you um, who are wondering what is all this about, um, we will be talking about upcoming Java 9 and modularity features in Java 9, and um, you'll hopefully figure out why, what I mean by not new. My name is Milan Diangov. I work for a company called LifeRay, just out of curiosity. How many of you have heard of LifeRay? Oh, that's good. That's more than half of the room. Good. So. Uh, if you know LifeRay, and for those of you who don't know, we historically do portals, and nowadays we do s things that we call like digital experience platform, which is basically a Java platform that you can build stuff on top of it. So we don't really build stuff for the end users. We just provide ready components that people kind of assemble together, create an application out of it. So for us, it's essentially building an applications which we don't really know how people will be using. So I have this question for you. Um, how many of you, I, I assume you are developers or work for companies that build software? So looking like one year back uh, in, in your careers and your experience, how many of you have uh, only deal with building software with, with exact requirements so that you knew up front what is it to be built? That's like, I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, you know, a lot of people tell, oh, you know, we do have the requirements. The thing is requirements often change. And uh, if you think, if you build things with, without actually having a very, very clear idea um, about, uh, about what you are building or things are subject to change, this is when you want to actually consider being as modular as possible. So when I say what's not new uh, in, in Java, uh, modular Java, basically I want you to think about not new as in not new concept and not as in like not new car, in a sense that there is a lot of new things coming uh, in a sense of tooling, in a sense of APIs maybe, um, in a sense of um, um, like frameworks, but I want to concentrate on the concept, not on the tooling, okay? So this is, this is what we will be talking about today. Okay, so now it's the time uh, to start thinking about modularity and I think I told you why. Um, and, um, I mean, you might say, well, I mean, that, that's nothing, um, nothing new, and you're right. Because if you look historically, <clears throat> what is to show up in Java 9, known as JCR uh, 376, uh, it's showed up in, tw in 2014, but the effort about modularizing Java started back in, to, uh, in 2005. And it's been a very, very long process trying to actually um, uh, bring modularity to Java with ups and downs. You know, Sun was doing something, then they were like, okay, let's do more, let's do less. Um, um, so at the end of the day, 2014 is where the actual real effort started and, um, and things started to look seriously. And they are serious uh, to the point that this year Oracle announced that they will postpone Java 9 because of Jigsaw. So if Jigsaw becomes so important that <clears throat> they decided to actually postpone the release of Java because of that. So you can see how much uh, modularity becomes important. And uh, what you will see here is a, uh, a photo I took last year at DevOx in Belgium. There was a um, survey asking uh, if we want to be using Jigsaw in 2016. Um, uh, surprisingly, they got it right. Uh, <laughs> but uh, one thing I really like is this, you can pry OSGI from my cold dead hands. <laughs> uh, and the reason I'm showing you this is because I'm going to do a lot of comparison between Java 9 and OSGI in this talk, just because OSGI is the de facto modularity standard in Java these days. But let's talk about what is modularity in Java. Um, okay, so 
you know, this quote, when, when I use a word, it means what I choose to mean. So that's basically what is with modularity, is we say modularity, and it means what we choose it to mean. So every, every time someone says modularity, someone has an idea about something which may not be the exact same thing the person who said that word has in mind. So to put things in a bit more structure, let's look at the, something that is known as modularity maturity model. Um, this is something that uh, Dr. Uh, Graham Charters introduced at uh, OSGI community event 2011, um, and it defines five, uh, actually six level of modularity. So this, at, at first level, you basically have no modularity. So this is how you build Java apps probably today. Then you have modules, which essentially means you decouple your uh, your artifact, you decouple your functionality from the artifact. The artifact, how you assemble your application becomes irrelevant. On level three, you're already decoupled uh, <clears throat> from the identity. So when you decouple from artifact, the only th way you refer to your code is by identity. If you think about Maven, for example, you don't rely on a jar file anymore. You don't really care what the jar file is, what's the name of the jar file, but you care about the identity of that jar file, which is a group ID and a, and a project ID or something. So at level, um, uh, at level three, you even decouple from that identity. Uh, at level four, uh, you already decouple yourself from implementation. Um, then you go even further, uh, decouple from ownership and from time. And I'll show you more in details those so you can understand what's actually happening in here. Um, he actually defined a level seven, uh, which is called Peter Kriens, and it's only available for Peter Kriens. Uh, if you don't know Peter Kriens, he's the lead architect at the OSGI Alliance, and um, he's like, the way he says, is eating and breeding modularity. But that's not what I'm going to talk about. So Peter Kriens then took over that in a book, Java Application Architecture. He, he didn't write the book, but he did, uh, he did the foreword for the book. And he actually referred to that modularity maturity model in there and said, uh, actually, I would define it a little bit different. At level one, I would say it's unmanaged. Then it's managed dependencies, then proper isolation, minimized coupling, and then at the end of the day, service-oriented architecture, which is more or less the same thing, but more in a conceptual terms than in actual practical Java, uh, uh, Java code. So not knowing which one to use, I was, OK, let me introduce my own. So here is a buzzword compliant maturity model, because that's what we all love these days, right? We do, we do buzzword programming. Okay? People show up on stage, tell us about microservices, and next day we start coding microservices. Right? They show us Docker, and we go like, yeah, cool. Right? So buzzword compatibility. OK, so in the exact same thing, you would think of level one as the monolith, the bad guy. Right? No one in this room does monoliths anymore, right? OK. So at level two, you have the composite. So you have bits and pieces. At, during your development time, then you assemble them together somehow and, uh, and deploy that thing. So you, you don't really have the monolith at, at build time. You kind of had the monolith at, the, the monolith at, at runtime, but you kind of compose your applications from modules. At level three, you have a proper isolation with containers. I didn't say Docker. I just said containers. Um, so, which obviously leads you to level five, where once, as soon as you start distributing those things, you need to discover them somehow. Um, and at the end of the day, when you're done with all this, you start doing what? Microservices, obviously, right? Anyone in this room who has not heard about microservices yet? I, I know, you're ashamed to admit. Okay, so. And if you look into that, <clears throat> this is how you, def how you put that in, in, in retrospective to a Java application. So when you do a monolith, you are basically unaware of your own dependencies. The reason is everything you need is together with you. You had this one huge whatever it is, jar of R, I don't know, and it's all in there. So you're basically unaware of any dependencies. 
Now, when you do the composite, you start dealing with dependencies, and you start being aware of all the infrastructural dependencies that you have. Okay? At level three, are you already kind of ignore the infrastructural dependencies, but you still have functional dependencies. You're basically saying, okay, I don't really depend on that jar, but I depend on that functionality. At level four, even that becomes obsolete. And you, what you start depending on is actually requirements. You don't really care if there is an artifact or not. What you care is if there is someone to solve your problem. Okay? And at level five, you're already in the state where you adapt to changing requirements. So you not only say, I, oh, those are my requirements, and my application deals with the requirements, but you say, I'm OK with those requirements changing at any point of time. Obviously, this is complex, but we'll see how that will work. So how do you do this today? Well, obviously, monolith is easy. You just do Java, nothing special about it. When you start doing Maven, for example, or anything that introduces identity for your components, then you're at level two, you do composites. At level three, you could do Java EE, Spring, or you could do CDI, you could do a bunch of other things. And this is the, the level where you start using annotations, you're smart, you don't say new Java class, whatever, but you say, oh, I depend on a component, and component is an abstraction. Um, so you can do this. Now, that's basically it. There is nothing that gives you up to level four. What, you, what brings you up all the way to level five is essentially OSGI. That's, that's basically what you have in Java. How many of you are familiar with OSGI? Oh, wow. That's like three quarter of the room. That's good. Sorry? <laughs> yeah. Who has ever implemented a, a, a li like a, a, a live production app in OSGI? See, half of the room. Okay. So if you use OSGI, you basically have this for granted. Um, so the question is, where this new stuff that comes in Java fits in? So it fits kind of like this. I couldn't draw it more uglier than this, but, um, but it, it's kind of like this, and I'll try to explain why. The reason why is because they were driven by a simple rule, keep it simple. Okay? And they said, okay, OSGI is way too complicated for what we want to achieve, so let's try to think about it and keep things simple. The question that you should ask yourself is, uh, can we keep it simple? And to answer that, first we're going to ask, what is actually a modularity from application perspective? So imagine that's your application. Sorry. Uh, yeah, that's your Java app. And basically, it's a bunch of classes like nicely working together. Um, and um, that's what it is, except that it's more like this. That's basically a bunch of classes in your platform. Then over there, up there, is your app. And in the middle is like tons of libraries that you use. right? And they all play nice together. Um, now, you want to modularize this. So what do you want to do? Like OSGI guys said, OK, let's look into that. So down there, that's the JVM. There's nothing we can do about it. We don't maintain that part. Sorry about that. It's going to stay that way. But there is a nice little thing in Java called class loaders. And we can take over that thing and actually decide how to load other stuff on top of that. And so you could actually introduce a dynamic multi-layer modular runtime on top of Java by managing class loaders. Now, obviously, Sun Oracle will argue that that's not the right way to do it, but it works. OK. So now you have this. The question is, what would, is going to be with these guys in the middle? <clears throat> so the OSGI Alliance said, well, actually, we have the modular framework. So it's super easy. So from now on, everyone should be building bundles, which is what they call modules in the OSGI world. And if you've been following that for a while, you know how well that worked. Um, people were building bundles like crazy. Okay, 
Now, let's look into how, uh, okay, before we look into that, I'm uh, going to give you another quote from Peter Kriens, uh, which is, when OSGI um, uh, started to get popular, it got a lot of criticism, saying that, uh, well, it's very complex framework, uh, it, it's, it's you know, very huge, and so forth. And what people don't seem to realize is that actually doing modularity right is the hard part. It's not the OSGI. It's, it's modularity itself. And I think um, Java 9, it's about to prove that fact. Um, but we'll see how that works. So how they solve the thing in, in Java 9? So basically, they own the JVM. So they made modules first-class citizens. So now you have modules in the JVM, which is cool. And then uh, they said, hey, let's go one step further. We'll now use modules to build applications. So they started showing you how to build applications out of modules. And the obvious thing to do, the same thing that OSGI Alliance did 10 years or, or 20 years ago, is like, well, everyone in the middle should be uh, doing modules. Essentially, you must be doing modules, uh, because um, if you don't, then you're, you still can uh, do legacy uh, code without modules in Java 9. But if you don't convert your stuff to modules, you're not going to work in a number of environments. And because this is something that is led by the owners of Java, this is going to put a lot of pressure on you. So essentially, you have to. OK, so if you look into that, basically, what's not new? Um, it's all the way up. Now, you have totally new stuff in the platform because it's made modular, and that is totally new. But everything from this line above, which is modules, uh, uh, like libraries, and your code, you could have done this years ago. You could have done this 15 years ago if you wanted to. Conceptually, it's nothing new to you. It's just now you can't have to do it because like other circumstances will be forcing you to do it. OK. So this is going to show some people that their babies are not as modular as they think they are, um, which is quite an interesting thing to observe. OK, but the question that we wanted to ask is when keep it simple is not enough and why this may not work. And to answer this, I'm going to um, argue that we still do a fundamental mistake while building software, which is we try to imagine the process of building software as equivalent to the process of building products. So if you want to build something, you get, you get the material. Out of the material, you create an uh, intermediate product, then another intermediate product, then you assemble those, and you get a product. And this is how we conceptually think about software. You get a library, another library using this library, and then we assemble those libraries, and we build things. So if you want to build this guy, what you're going to need is a bunch of things. You're going to need some tools. You're going to need some components, like memory, whatever. You're going to need some software. You're going to need some, something to program it. And those are your dependencies. If you, you happen to miss one of those, you cannot build the thing. OK? Now, if you think about it, oh, these guys also have their dependencies. Like, you cannot produce, uh, like, uh, I don't know, a computer without actually having computer parts. And they cannot produce computer parts without you know, having some tools and so forth. So this is, becomes a dependency graph. And what you will see in here is, hopefully notice, it's a very oversimplified dependency graph because it doesn't have any circular uh, dependencies in it. In a real world scenario, though, if you think about it, well, this guy's producing tools, will be probably using computers. And these guys, uh, um, I don't know, with the um, network components, will be probably using some kind of software. So if you were to draw this in a real world scenario, you would be have arrows pointing every single direction. Right? But when we build software, we say, OK, circular dependencies are bad. So let's keep things simple and like, make it a, um, a nice looking graph. And essentially, this is what it is. You have an entity. An entity offers you something. You use that something to build something else. 
and then you offer something from yourself, and at the end of the day, you assemble a product. So when you think of applications, you do the exact same thing. You have a bunch of artifacts. These artifacts are offering you some functionality. You use that functionality, you assemble an application. Again, this is very oversimplified thing. So let's kind of combine those with the, modular, with the um, maturity, modularity maturity model and see the two solutions that we know of, like OSGI and JSR376, and how they deal with that stuff. So at level two, well, ignore level one. We don't care about the bad guy. Um, so in OSGI, first of all, let's talk about packaging. In OSGI, everything is a jar file, um, which is OK. We know jar files. Uh, in JSR376, you can either do jar or JMode. It's just a new, new thing they introduced. And you want to decouple yourself from the artifact. So in OSGI, you would provide a what's known as bundle symbolic name. And that is something that identifies your module. In uh, JSR376, you have this module in for Java where you put a module name. So now you don't refer to the artifact, but you are uh, referring to what you depend on by identity. So you're now de decoupled from the artifact. So that's totally OK. That's why, as you can see, level two, it's good. Java 9 will solve that problem. Now let's look at level three. Um, the first thing is to define what you are going to offer to other people. So in OSGI, you would do something that's known as export package. It's basically you're going to say, OK, this is the functionality I give to others. And in Java 9, you would say exports and a package name. Pretty similar. Looks OK. Let's look at the flip side of that, though, how you use stuff. Now, if you've been doing OSGI for a while, you may know about require bundle. And require bundle was a very popular back in the old days in OSGI, and it's kind of um, don't do it these days. The reason is uh, it, you, you kind of uh, not expressing yourself. I'll show that in a second. But that is essentially what Java 9 will offer you. Java 9 will say requires some other module. And in OSGI, the proper way to do it is to use import package. Now, you may think, OK, what's the, the difference? It's the same thing. I'll tell you what the difference is in this example. Imagine that someone offers you a power plug, and you need a power plug for whatever you're building. In OSGI, you're stating that you need a power plug. You don't really care who provides it to you as long as someone provides it to you. OK? You explicitly state what is your dependency, what you expect to have. Whereas in Java, you don't say you need a power plug, but instead you say you depend on Foo, or whatever the company or provider name is, because you know that this provider provides power plugs, and you know that this is the only provider that provides power plugs. Now, if you switch back to real life, you would never do that. You would never depend on a particular producer of something, right? But it's totally OK in Java world because we want to keep things simple, right? So in, in terms of changing things, if these plugs have versions for whatever reason, we can state that in OSGI. We can say, you know what? I want to work with any plug that it's version 2.0 or, or, or higher. You cannot do that in, in, in Java 9. You can actually, you need to let developer, a person, know which version of the implementation you depend on. OK? So another thing is transitive dependencies. So what happens if uh, my power plug, I need, for example, a um, something, and that something returns an object that comes from another module? So in OSGI, you have this uses case. And in uh, Java 9, you have requires public. Now, again, it may seem that it's the same thing, but if you think about it conceptually, so in OSGI, 
basically the provider tells you, oh, by the way, so I'm, use, I, I, I'm saying I need a computer. And they say, oh, by the way, for this computer, we use these power plugs. So if you want to play with the power plugs or replace them yourself, you know, this is what we used. But in Java 9, essentially what they tell you what requires public is, well, we depend on that provider of power plugs. And now, because you use our computer, you also depend on that provider of power plugs. Which is insane if you think about it in, in, in real life scenario. It's totally okay here, just to keep things simple. Okay? So, level three in Java 9, as you can see, does not really offer us a fully decoupled, uh, deco full decoupling from identity. We still are tied to the identity. Of, of the thing that we are using. Let's go for level four, which is decoupled from implementation. And what does that mean? Well, in OSGI, at some point in time, you realize that the whole thing about dependencies in jar files and bundles is totally not the, the story. The story is to not express your requirements, uh, sorry, your dependencies, but express your requirements. So you're not going to say, hey, I need a power plug, because you don't need a power plug. You need to be connected to a socket. That's what you need. Right? It may be a power plug or maybe something else, but your actual requirement is to be connected to a power socket. Right? So this is what you express using, for example, keep requirements and capabilities. And you say, I need to connect to a power outlet. And someone else will say, I can do that for you. You don't need to care how. I may do, use a power plug. I may use something else. I'll do that for you. And that's OK. Your requirement is fulfilled. You cannot do anything of this in Java 9 unless you code it yourself. Okay? And this is what is mean by decoupled from implementation, because you now don't need to think, but you need the functionality that normally you would use from that thing. Okay. <clears throat> so, level four. Sorry about that. Uh, there are some means to do this by yourself if you really want to. Uh, there are some APIs coming in Java 9 that allow you kind of to do things like that, but, uh, but not really. Uh, not really easy to do. Okay. Let's finally look at, at level 5. <clears throat> so at level 5, you want to deal with changing requirements and changing stuff all over the place. Basically dynamism. And... Um, you have this thing in OSGI that is known as a service registry. So basically what you do is you create a service, you register it with a service registry, you can have multiple services implementing the same contract, you could have a bunch of properties, you have LDAP filters, so from your client perspective you can say, okay, give me a service that does A, B, C, and D and matches this and this and this criteria. And OSGI registry will give you a service. If that service goes away, for whatever reason, you can say, OK, if that service goes away, give me another one. Or um, if a new service shows up in the meantime, which is for whatever reason better for me, just replace it. So you have the full dynamism of, of, uh, to deal with changing stuff. I'm sorry to tell you, but there is nothing from, like this coming from in Java 9. In fact, if you go to the Java 9, the Jigsaw uh, project website and look at the, they have a very nice page. It states what is a, requir what is a uh, requirement and a non-requirement. And versioning and dynamism are explicitly stated there as non-requirements. So that's not going to happen in Jigsaw. Um, so level five, totally, um, you can totally forget about it unless you want to do it yourself, or a miracle happens and they all of a sudden figure out that, for example, Java EE will need that, and then some projects on Java EE side actually implement that. So this is how Java 9, Jigsaw in particular, would, will kind of fit into this modularity maturity model. And so the question that you may ask yourself is, okay, wait a minute, did they get it right? I mean. Like, if a random guy from a company can stand up on stage and says, okay, this is, you know, it's not going to happen, why they cannot figure it out themselves? Uh, wh why is Oracle doing it wrong? 
The thing is, they are not doing it wrong because of this. When you say modularity in Java, you mean exactly what you want it to mean. And the question is how they have defined modularity. The way they have defined modularity is totally fine for the purpose they wanted to achieve. Because if you look into the goals of JSR 376, there, some of them are listed here, that not all, but there is no, not a goal to actually support level five modularity. They never wanted to do that. What they wanted to do is to, sh to, to clear up the, um, the Java platform from all these dependencies, to be able to split the Java platform into a small packages so you don't have to run the whole Java every time you run a simple app. And, and they did that. They solved the problem they had. Now, the thing is they went one step further and say, oh, cool, now that we have done this for the platform, this is how you should build your applications. And this is where I, as a person who has spent enormous amount of time dealing with modularity, have an issue. Because it, for the Java platform, what Oracle did was great. Now you can have a very tiny little Java running. You can do microservices without you know, embedding 300 megabytes of things. But this is not a universal solution to go and tell people, OK, this is how you should build applications. Now, in the OSGI world, there is a uh, belief that this is actually a good thing, because once people start using Java 9 and, and modularity, and they will be kind of forced to, to deal with modularity, they will start to figure out what the complexity is, where the complexity comes from. And they, once they realize it's not OSGI that is complex, but actually building modular apps in a proper way is not an easy thing, they will start looking for more robust solutions, and here you go, they will jump into the OSGI. I'm not quite sure this is going to happen, um, um, but um, uh, maybe, maybe that will be the case. We'll see how the things will go. So, uh, the question that you want to finally ask yourself is, do I need level five modularity, actually? And the answer to that is, what is modularity, essentially? Uh, like regardless of how different people will define it. The fundamental thing about modularity is dealing with not knowing. And every, every, your only reason to, to do modularity is to deal with not knowing. If you have, that's the reason I ask you upfront, if you only build applications on um, exact requirements that you have upfront. If you have a very simple application that says it's gonna be a chat, right? You can type in, you can you know, read the response, that's it. You don't build modular wrap out of that because it makes no sense because you know your exact requirements right in the beginning, you know what you need to build, you build it, you run it, and you're happy. But if you build an application that you don't really know what's gonna happen with it, if you at any point have to deal with not knowing stuff, this is where you need modularity, and you need modularity at level five. And this is exactly our case. At LifeRay, we build a platform where People grab that platform and build all kinds of different things out of it. For example, you can grab a life ray and build a um, intranet, or you can build a website, or you can build a collaboration platform, or you can build whatever you want. And there is literally no way for us to know how this thing will be used. So we can go either Microsoft way, like they do with SharePoint, and say, okay, this is an intranet solution. You buy it and you use it the way we design it because we know how intranet should work. We have the solution for you. It's great. Go ahead. Or you can do what we do and say, OK, let's split the whole thing into modules. Let's go down to microservices. And what we call microservices here, down here, is actually what is being known in OSGI world for the last I don't know, 10, 15 years as microservices. Those are in VM microservices. They behave conceptually the same way as the microservices you know, 
but they don't add the complexity of remote stuff, serializing, deserializing, discovery, and so forth, because you have this in OSGI already. So this is how we switched from a portal, uh, which used the portal spec as a um, building foundation, to a microservice-based platform where you can build whole kind of things. And so um, we all right now have over 100 apps, 600 models, 25,000 microservices, and th those numbers are growing every day. The reason I'm telling you this is not because um, to, to, to make you use Lifeway or something, but so that to give you an example of, of a product that is actually using this real time, real life, that is being product, used in production for a very long time. Uh, and so this, this works. So this is where you need modularity, and, and, and this is what we choose to do. Um, Obviously, LifeRay is uh, open source. For those of you that don't know, you can go download the code and see how it works. It's totally OSGI based these days. Um, and this is for a few examples from the source code. Like, for example, this is how we support um, JAXRS in, in, in LifeRay. If you want to build a REST service, that's totally fine. You all, all you need to do is you need to say that you require a capability. And the capability that you require is by OSGI contract a JAXRS. And you don't really care. That's it. From your point of view, you're saying, if there is a JAXRS, I will work. If there is no JAXRS, I will not. Now, the flip side of that is another module that provides you a JAXRS capability. It basically says, OK, I'm here. I'm not sure which one is this. Um, let's say that's Jackson or whatever, um, uh, and say, I do provide that capability. If those two match, they work. Okay? This, the, what we use heavily internally is an OSGI framework known as a um, declarative services. And declarative services uses annotations to actually discover components. So in here, I have a filter, which I just register as an as a OSGI component somewhere in, in some service registry. And at some other point of time, uh, I have this thing called reference, which basically says, go to the registry and grab me a, something that implements, uh, I don't have the type on the screen. It's after the parent, but whatever the type of the method is. And, and give me that, an implementation of that thing from your registry. Oh, and by the way, the policy is dynamic, saying, I can run with or without that thing. Okay? If that thing goes away, I'm fine. I'll do it my, on my own. If it's still there, then, then fine. I'll, I'll use it. Okay? So this is how we actually deal with, with not knowing. We don't know what service will be there at what time, at what time it will disappear, uh, what version of that service will be there. But the code is flexible. The code allows you to adjust to whatever happens at runtime. And this is nothing, there is no other Java technology at the moment out there which allows you to do this. So that's why we choose OSGI. Because, back again, the sense of modularity is not knowing. And when you acknowledge the fact that you don't know upfront, you're basically forced to think in terms of predictability. Can't remember that hard word. Um, so you want to try to predict what's going to happen. And trying to predict reminds you of something? Agility. If, if you go to agile conferences or, or you're doing agile at your work and you do all these stand-up meetings and all this agile thing, the whole Agile thing is about predictability. And that's what you should transfer to your application. You should be Agile. You should be built applications that are capable of adapting to changing requirements. Not, obviously, you cannot adapt to anything out there. But you, you need to think of, like, to predict what may happen, what may not, and make your applications in a way that they are actually Agile, that they're actually able to adapt to all those requirements without you having to rebuild them uh, every, time, uh, every time this happens. 
Okay, that's pretty much it. Um, one final note I wanted to show you is we are doing this DEF conference in uh, Darmstadt in Germany in what is November. And this is typically a very product specific conference, so you may not be interested in, in that part of it. But this year we'll have a dedicated uh, modularity track on it. Uh, and we'll probably have people from OSGI Alliance. There's going to be a lot of IoT things because this is where like modularity comes uh, really handy. So uh, if, if you are interested in modularity in OSGI, in IoT, uh, you may want to check this out. Um, November, uh, just follow the website. Um, okay, that's it from me for today. I think we still have like 10 minutes for questions. So um, go ahead and ask. Uh, one question here. <laughs> Uh, I just wondered, but you say keep it simple. That sometimes it's not a good thing. However, yeah. do you think that if they decided to go on OSGI, probably to take them, I don't know, 10 years, to 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 actually migrate fully on OSGI? And why don't you think that what you show is in OSGI there was an import bundle in the past that no one I'm sorry uh, there was this bundle dependency on another bundle right. that no one now uses. While in models, yes, it is a model depending on another model, but this doesn't exclude that in the next iteration of Jigsaw, they will add the additional way to explain requirements. If yeah. this is really what the people want, and if the other guy is, is, is correct and everyone, everyone went to OSGI, it's a win-win situation. I mean, why keep no, it simple is, is, I don't, is a bad I, thing. I don't want to put a that in a, in, a, in a situation of like one is better than the other. I'm, I'm just comparing what we have now. I mean, obviously, 10 years from now, it may turn out that they re-implement OSGI or they just decide to use OSGI or whatever. Um, um, I'm just telling you what we have this not right. Because if you go to any like, major European conference or US conference, what Oracle is doing these days is trying to tell people, hey, listen, we have modularity, so you should be now doing it. And I'm just saying, if you jump into it right now, you'll be facing these things. Right? I, I don't know what's going to be in two, three, five, ten years from now. But right now, it's not even close to the state where you can do a real modular, modular programming. And why they didn't use OSGI, I don't know. I personally think it's more political than technical decision. Um, but I'm not involved in, in, I know they had a conversation, like the, the Java guys and, um, and the OSGI alliance, and they didn't come to agreement. I have no idea um, what happened. And, and the official statement that I've heard from, uh, from the uh, Oracle architects is that OSGI is way too complicated for what they need, and they want to keep it simple. Um, so that, that's the official answer. As a matter of fact, at DevOps last year, there were a number of questions about how to do this with Java 9, like how to do this, how to do that, how to, like all this stuff that I show you that you cannot do. And I think the final answer was, uh, from the Java architects was use OSGI. Uh, so they are fully aware of the fact that, um, um, that this does not provide all the functionality that people will need. They are fully aware of the fact this messes up huge time with all the vendors that build libraries, like guys from Spring um, and, and, and everyone else. Actually, if you go f uh, on the forums, for Jigsaw, Jigsaw forums, and, 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 and follow the, the discussions. You see a bunch of library vendors in there, like pulling their head off, like how do we do this uh, in, in Java 9? Uh, so it, it's not that they're like, oh, okay, this is it, and you know, we don't care. They're they fully aware of the issues. They're trying to solve them. Um, how long is that gonna take? There is a reason why Java 9 is postponed by a year, so. Okay, I yeah, have... There's a question at right at the end. Okay, uh, you need to wait for the mic. Yeah. In the <laughs> meantime, I have 
three quick questions. It's over oh. here. Oh, so, sorry, I barely see yeah. you. It's so dark. Um, so I'll start one by one. So uh, first one is, isn't the LifeRay platform itself a monolith? And is there a minimalistic implementation of LifeRay? Yeah, there is. Out of, this is, as I show you right now, this is a hundred, I think more, mm, no, 600 modules, I think it was. You can run it with, I don't know, 60 or 16 if you want to. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's how we um, actually adapt to different environments. So if you want to run, uh, uh, for example, only a block service, you probably need five to ten bundles, mm -hmm. uh, to, to, and, and you can delete all the rest. The reason we give it as a whole thing is so that people can try it out, all the things that, that, that we have to offer. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, actually, you could just go to the modules folder and just delete the jar files that you don't use, mm -hmm. and you can do that at the runtime. In that regard, my second question is, do you think a minimalistic uh, modular layer implementation of OSGI is comparable to performance with Jigsaw? I don't know. I don't know what's the performance of Jigsaw. N official uh, answer to a very similar question from a conference, I don't remember which one, from the Oracle Architects was that they expect it to be faster because modules are now native thing in Java and they don't do the class loader thing. Uh, so they don't deal with, with like swapping class loaders, building a, a dedicated class loader per bundle and so forth. And from that perspective, they expect it to behave better. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know of anyone who has done any benchmarking or, or, or anything that proves or disproves that. Um, it may be the case, but I don't know. But we're talking like, I don't know what, nanoseconds here? Mm -hmm. uh, Something like this, yeah. yeah. And my last question is, um, do, you know, do you know if Project uh, Penrose is moving on? in providing interoperability between Jigsaw and OSGI? As far as I know, it's, it's um, abundant. Uh, from my, at least that's what it looks like. The last time I looked at, at, at Penrose, I think it was a couple of months ago, the last commit was, I think, two years old or three years old or something like that. So I don't know, I don't know if anyone is working on that. If, um, I have no official information, but from what I can see, no one is working on that, and, uh, and there is no interest uh, in, in, in that area. So mm -hmm. probably nothing is going to happen unless someone takes over and decides it actually makes sense to, yeah. to continue doing something with it. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, yeah. okay so uh, my question is about the Wi-Fi platform. If I want to build a minimalistic uh, product, let's say, that includes just what I need, right. uh, is there a tool that would... Uh, uh, just guide me and uh, and select only the modules that my product needs. So, uh, if I let's say uh, deploy my product, is there right. something that would uh, say, okay, these couple of things there are not used, and just assemble the minimalistic thing? So uh, that's a very good question, and the answer is yes and no. Uh, the reason is yes and no is because you don't, as I showed you earlier, you don't really have a direct dependencies, meaning you only resolve when you need to resolve. So when you say I require a capability, um, then you only you will know when your bundle deploys and actually explicitly declares that. So you can try to use tools like BND or BND tools to do the um, compile time resolve and, and figure out, okay, those are my bundles, let's figure out, let's do a, a compile time resolve and see what I'm, uh, what I'm gonna need. Uh, but then, you know, the whole purpose of, of thing is that it can change dynamically. So it may turn out later on at runtime that you're actually missing something that, um, uh, that is, uh, that's not, uh, you need something that's not there. To make it a little bit easier, what we did was we restructured the whole thing now into um, uh, modules, and modules are in groups. So we have, for example, collaboration group. And all the models regarding collaboration are in that group. So if you go to the collaboration folder you can, and you say, I don't use collaboration, you can safely delete all those. Right? Or you can just go to, say, uh, uh, I don't know, um, workflow folder or something else. Um, but again, it, it, it's not really easy to tell at compile time what your dependency will be uh, at runtime. So it's going to take you some adjustments, so to say. 
Okay. But you can do that, but it's going to take you time. Uh, and this is putting you in a situation where you have pretty much fixed environment. Uh, so I'm not saying that you always need to run with all the bundles, um, but you need to be prepared to just add or remove bundles at, at a time when, when, when you need them. Mm -hmm. Okay? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. More questions? Yes, oh, yes, one question from here. Okay, uh, in your presentation, uh, actually you are talking most of the time about uh, application running in a single JVM, so modularity right. in single JVM. But practically nowadays, when people mention microservices, they right. most of the time they mean uh, small application running in different JVMs. Right. And in this case, service discovery and this dynamicity that you mentioned as a level four, level five, by can be implemented in the JVM, but they should be outside of the JVM. Right. So in this case, isn't OSGI overkill and actually the GSR better fit for this situation? Oh, thank you so much for that question. I was worried no one's going to ask it. Okay, so let's talk about microservices. I told you we have, what was it, 600 modules and 2,500 microservices, right? Would you be able to implement that in the way that you understand microservices? 25,000 microservices, each running in a separate environment with its own database. You probably would if you have enough people with the knowledge. And please don't ask me to maintain that. So there is a, a degree of complexity which you need to take into account. If you're building 5, 10, 15 microservices, that's probably fine. If you're Netflix, you, you can probably go with hundreds. Uh, but other than that, um, you are adding a degree of complexity. You are adding a degree of, um, uh, of uh, security complexity, of performance complexity, and all kinds of other complexities. So complexity that you normally deal with within the JVM, you are now moving to a layer up, to networking, to maintenance, to imagine how you collect and investigate logs from 2,500 microservices. And a customer picks up the phone and says, you know what, I click a button on your page and nothing happens. And now you have 2,500 microservices and you need to figure out the click on a button called which hundred of those and which one didn't work, right? So, as I said, I'm not against microservices. I'm against not using common sense. Because someone said we should do microservices, everyone, like remote services, everyone jumps in and now do, does it. It makes sense in a lot of situations, and a lot of situations should not be doing OSGI. You should be doing microservices. But most of the time, when you have complex applications, you want to keep your options open as, to, as long in the process, as late in the process as you can. And with OSGI, you can do that. With OSGI, you can go remote. There is a spec. It's called distributed OSGI. You have all the discovery. You pretty much have everything that you have in a local environment. And you can go distribute it if you want to. It's how you design your app. You design your app. You solve your business problem first. And once you have your business problem solved, then you figure out how to deploy the thing. If the, in my personal opinion, the mistake that like 90% of the people make these days is they are doing things the opposite way. They start building apps and say, let's do microservices. That's deployment option. You don't want to make that decision the first decision of your project. You want that decision to be the latest decision of your project. Solve your business problem, then figure out how you deploy. That's my opinion on that. I don't know if that answers your question or not, but... Yes, yes, it was a really good answer, but my opinion was that based, of course, on your presentation, that actually the Oracle uh, specification is uh, fit... Yeah, to, they kind of go in that space. I agree with that. And, of course, if you want to be, to have good uh, modularity in process, OSGI is always uh, at hand. Yeah, I think Oracle goes in that direction. That, that is probably a good observation.
I don't think we have time for more questions because this is like blinking zeros on me. Uh, but I'll be around, so find me, and I'm, I'll be happy to talk to you about it and argue about it. Thank you, guys.